Hello and welcome to the Irish History Podcast. My name is Finn DeWire and this is Secret Societies, Communism and Coal, Life in the Castle Cormor Colliery, Part 3. The last instalment of this series about the fascinating Castle Cormor Collieries took us through the bleak years of the Great Famine when the region was decimated. We saw many starve to death while many more emigrated. This episode takes us through the uncertainty of the post-famine years, the huge changes that followed, and finally brings us to the land war which triggered the Great Coal Strike of 1881. This part of the story was very difficult to write, as there's very little research conducted on Castle Comer during these years, so I had to spend a long time in newspaper archives and the National Library piecing the story together. If you have any questions or information you feel I've not covered in this podcast, please get in touch at history at irishhistorypodcast.ie. That's history at irishhistorypodcast.ie. Castle Comer emerged from the famine, like much of Ireland, a broken society, and for those who had survived, life was by no means easy. Death, along with emigration, had torn the close-knit communities of the coal field apart. Its people spread across the world. Most would never return to the town of their birth. For those who had remained behind, the countryside, once heaving with people, was now full of painful ghosts. Memories of childhood friends or their fellow colliers who they had risked life and limb with down dark coal mines. In the National Library in Dublin, the Wandersford State Papers, the Wandersfords were the landlords of Castle Comer, preserve rent books from the 1850s which list several tenants having orphans living with them. These must have been the children whose parents had succumbed to starvation or disease during the Great Famine. Life for these people who had survived in the early 1850s would remain a desperate struggle as they faced a deeply uncertain world. While the worst depths of the Great Famine had passed by 1852, the threat of eviction and forced emigration were a feature of life that hung over the heads of many. Indeed, between 1851 and 1861, the decade after the famine, the population of Leinster, where Castle Comer is situated, fell by 12.9%. In the Castle Comer area, emigration may not have been as severe as other areas, as the coal pits did offer employment. However, the people still faced great uncertainty as the Wandersford family began to restructure their estate. Many landlords had gone bust during the famine, and Charles Wandersford was adamant that this would not happen to him or his family. His main goal was control. Charles wanted to cut out the middlemen who managed his lands across Castlecomer, restructure the land and maximise his profits. By the late 1850s he had managed to take back around 15% of the estate into his control by revoking the leases that had been given to middlemen. This created great uncertainty however in Castlecomer. For example, in the 1850s, the lease of Robert Kane, a middleman, was revoked and the land was taken back by the Wandersford family. One of their first measures, though, was to evict many of Robert Kane's subtenants, presumably because they wanted to enlarge the holdings and make them more profitable. The feeling of being unwillingly forced from your home and having to emigrate after surviving the horrors of famine must have provoked the most intense bitterness and rage. However, while he enjoyed some success restructuring his land, his coal mines were very different. Attempts to carry out changes there in the 1830s had resulted in a near uprising in the colliery, so any changes were potentially highly risky. Nevertheless, in the 1850s, Charles Wandersford pressed ahead. By the early 1850s, Charles Wandersford was a relatively old man for the age. He had been born in 1779, but he still pushed ahead with plans to restructure the coal pits. He had never had a better opportunity. In the 1830s, he had been confronted and defeated by the miners' secret societies who had killed mine managers and harassed guards. However, as we saw in part two, emigration and famine had hit the coal mining communities hardest. Their secret societies, which were rooted in communities that had existed for centuries, had been hollowed out by emigration and starvation. The first major change was seen in 1853, 
when Charles Rondesford managed to controversially reopen the Jarrow coal mine, which had been at the heart of the dispute in 1832 and closed ever since. This was a deep mine which employed modern techniques and broke the old, ineffective master collier system. While they had opposed the changes in the 1830s, the reopening of the Jarrow was unquestionably an improvement for the miners of Castlecomer. While it was a deeper mine and the work was harder, it was far safer. However, before he could complete other changes in the coal district, Charles Wandesford died at the age of 81 at the family's ancestral home at Kirklington in Yorkshire in England. When word arrived in Castlecomer, it must have provoked mixed emotions. For those who had been evicted, or perhaps had seen family evicted and forced to emigrate, they can have had little sympathy for this man. After his death, Wandesford's family continued to pursue the difficult work of restructuring the, the coal mines, even though the family heir, another Charles Wandesford, was still only a boy. It was not until 1874 that he came of age, and on St. Patrick's Day that year, the young Charles, aged only 19, arrived in Castlecomer to be welcomed by huge celebrations in the town. A committee of local merchants had been meeting for two months, planning the welcome. Triumphal arches were erected and celebrations indicated some sense of the peaceful times that reigned in the 1870s and how at least some of the community viewed their landlord and the changes they were bringing about. I doubt any landlord in Castlecomer would have wanted any public welcome back in the 1830s when he would in all likelihood have faced an assassination attempt. That year the future of the coal mines was somewhat settled for the medium term at least when all major operations were wrestled from the master colliers and middlemen and the vast majority of the mines were leased to just one man, Joseph Dobbs, the son of Kildare Dobbs, a family who had been involved in the management of mines at Castlecomer for decades. Remarkably though, through all these twists and turns, the coal district was almost entirely peaceful. Thirty years earlier, these changes would definitely have led to violence and murder. However, Castlecomer of the 1860s and early 1870s was a very different place than it had been four decades earlier. While I have already discussed the impact, the famine, there were other factors at play as well. The wider economy in Ireland in general was improving while emigration continued. Living standards were improving, albeit from appallingly low levels. Wages were generally on the rise. This was a disincentive from protest. Simply put, the people may have had something to lose for the first time in a very, very long time. The improvement of these years was not just evidenced on pay packets. There were also other major changes afoot, things that would really influence the Great Strike of 1881. Education, for example, was on the rise and for the first time many were learning to read and write. By 1881, 75% of the population were literate. This saw the number of newspapers rise from 100 in 1852 to 140 in 1871. Rural Ireland was becoming less and less isolated as well. Railways began to crisscross the island, increasing to 2,000 miles of track by 1870. That said, the railway would not reach Castlecomer for many decades. In these years, the telegraph, the first modern means of near-instant communication, also spread across the country. There must have been a tremendous sense of technological change in the air. For the first time, perhaps, a newspaper might have been found in the homes of miners, as young adults, at least, could read. In the town, at the heart of the coalfield, miners could hear news of events that had happened in Dublin that very day by telegraph. This was the modern world arriving in Castlecomer. While this unquestionably undermined the clannish secret society politics of the 1830s, unbeknownst to many, it was forming a new outlook on the world, and when crisis threatened the coal field again in the 1870s, a new politics of trade unionism would take hold. So far we've seen that life in Castlecomer since the famine, while laced with uncertainty and change, had unquestionably been improving. However, in the late 1870s, a dark shadow crept slowly over life across Ireland. In 1874, the global economy went into recession and Castlecomer 
was never more connected to the world at large and susceptible to the impact of this recession. This would lead to the Great Strike of 1881, but first we need to understand a series of events known as the Land War which triggered that strike. So I want to take a few minutes to take a minor detour to explain the Land War. As the recession hit home in the late 1870s, in a phenomenon that is all too familiar today, farmers were increasingly living off credit. In 1879, a terrible dynamic entered this situation. While many no doubt thought they would never see the like of it again, the haunting spectre of famine returned to the west of Ireland in particular when the potato crop failed. This unleashed one of the biggest rebellions in Irish history. The spark that lit the flame took place in the west of Ireland in Mayo when landlords started threatening eviction on tenants who had fallen into arrears. However, by the 1870s, a new generation were committed to ensuring there would be no repeat of the events of the Great Famine of the 1840s. They were not going to die on the side of the road, having been evicted like their parents, and when they fell into arrears in the late 1870s, they began to organise to stop landlords evicting them from their land. In April 1879, in the west of Ireland, huge tenant meetings with attendances in some cases numbering in the tens of thousands, took place across Mayo in particular. After enjoying great successes in the closing months of that year, what had initially been a Mayo-based organisation became the Irish National Land League, and this movement began to spread across the island. While helping to alleviate famine conditions, they demanded tenant rights and vociferously resisted eviction. The most famous tactic used, which would be very important in the Castlecomer strike of 1881, was the boycott. This saw those who opposed the movement shunned by their community in every way possible. People would refuse to work for them, speak to them, sell goods to them or engage with them in any way at all. In some cases, they would even turn their backs when they approached them on the road, almost as if they were already dead. By 1880, Ireland was in the midst of great upheaval events that would be called the Land War. The increase in literacy and the explosion of newspapers had seen people for the first time read themselves about what was happening elsewhere. Soon the ten farmers and miners in Castle Comer were inspired by these events in the west of Ireland. As the struggle for better conditions, tenant rights and resistance to evictions spread like wildfire, they reached fever pitch in Castle Comer in the summer of 1881. The first serious incident I could find saw the cattle of the Proctor family, millers in the town, hocked by Land League activists. Now, hocking was a pretty brutal mutilation of the animals which maimed their legs so they would be of little value for the rest of their lives. A few weeks later, on July the 30th, 1881, there was a big demonstration in solidarity with a local leading figure of the Land League in the town who had recently lost a court case. It was quite clear in that summer of 1881 tensions were building and in early August another large demonstration was called in Cretty Yard located in the heart of the coal district. The intention here was to protest against a man refusing to boycott a land grabber. This was someone who had taken the land of an evicted tenant. During the demonstration a shot rang out and tragically a child was struck by the wayward bullet and died. This seems to have only added to the tension in the wider Castlecomer area and the Land League movement through the following weeks seemed unstoppable. On August 10th, a leading national figure of the League, John Dillon, who recently had been released from prison, arrived in Castlecomer to a carnival-like atmosphere. The town brass band led a torchlit parade through the streets and, as celebrations continued on into the night, tar barrels were lit in the streets. For those living through these heady days of the summer of 1881 in Castlecomer, when word arrived of the unexpected death of their landlord, the 26-year-old Charles Wandesford in London, earlier in July, it can only have added to the sense that change was coming. While this was taking place, Castlecomer's miners were by no means removed from this struggle. They themselves were all tenants living in these communities and no doubt took part in these demonstrations and were affected by them. However, there had been little by way of protests in the mines themselves in decades. That was about to change though. As the Land League was demanding better conditions for tenants, the miners did not want to be left behind and soon they received inspiration from further afield. 
While the rebellious atmosphere was brewing in Castlecomer in that summer of 1881, two delegations from the well-organised mining communities in Durham and Cleveland in England had arrived on a fact-finding mission in Ireland. Now their sympathies lay with the Land League and they wanted to get some sense of what was happening across Ireland. They travelled through Ulster and Connacht before returning to Dublin and then heading home. While they never visited the Castlecomer coalfield, their presence in Ireland was widely reported in the press and in an age where the majority could now read, this undoubtedly provoked great interest among the colliers in Castlecomer. These were well-organised coal miners who had achieved quite a lot already in the coal mines of England. While it's entirely possible some of the miners from Castlecomer travelled to meet them, there is no evidence of this. However, I think it's a rather unusual coincidence that around this time the first workers' organisation appeared in the coal field. This was the Gazebo Brass Band and Benefit Society, named by the miners in the townland of Gazebo outside Castlecomer. Now, despite its quite unusual name, this was effectively a trade union of sorts. Inspired by events elsewhere and in an age of rising expectations, the miners in Castlecomer finally went on strike on August 1st, 1881, demanding higher wages. Two of the three big pits, the famously named Jarrow and the other named The Rock, were shut down by the workers. This was the first strike of any kind in over a generation, but in many ways it was totally new. Previous unrest in the coal field had been defensive in nature and organised around secret societies, but in 1881 the colliers were on the attack demanding higher wages. The mine manager Joseph Dobbs was in England at the time, but it was expected when he returned the dispute would be settled. However, this was a severe misjudgment. Dobbs did return in late August, but his arrival had no impact. He refused to relent while the miners were equally determined to stay the course, but the prospect of a long strike was grim. Their newly formed workers' association did not have funds built up to pay miners when they were on strike. Needing help, they approached the local Land League branch in the nearby town of Clock, seeking solidarity. Now, while the miners pleaded for aid, meanwhile, Joseph Dobbs began to adopt an obstinate position, refusing to even meet the strikers, and a long strike now seemed inevitable. By August the 24th, this began to hit home in Castlecomer. Eighty miners, having little option, left the coal field from poverty. However, their leaving was well choreographed, presumably designed to invoke sympathy for their comrades still on strike. The town brass band accompanied them with a huge crowd as they left Castlecomer. They then, however, had a lonely 17-mile walk to the town of Athy to board train for Dublin and head to the pits of Yorkshire in England. In early September, the remaining miners in Castlecomer now on strike for five weeks, received a great boon when the Land League gave them £30, a considerable amount of money for the time. Increasingly confident, the strike now spread to the Monteen, another pit under Dobbs' control. From the perspective of Dobbs, the situation was clearly getting out of control. All these coal mines were completely shut down by the miners. Already inspired by the Land League, the strikers had adopted their tactics. Approaches to the Jarrow, the Rock and the Monteen were now marked with signs warning people to turn back and to be careful of themselves and their property. This was an effort to stop coal already being mined before the strike being sold. To increase their impact, the miners also instituted a boycott against Joseph Dobbs and all those who worked for him. This helped to polarise society in Castlecomer, forcing many to take a stance on the strike because they had to decide now to boycott Joseph Dobbs or risk being boycotted themselves. Now having the force of the miners, the Land League and what appears to have been the wider Castlecomer community against him, Joseph Dobbs began to look towards a settlement. Negotiations were overseen by the parish priest and clock, Father Halloran, and the local doctor, Mr Moran. A deputation of six men represented the miners and they negotiated with Joseph Dobbs. This led to one of the first wage settlements in the coal field and a great victory for the colliers as they succeeded in getting their wages increased. There were other smaller concessions but sadly these were not detailed. There was little doubt that by September 1881 the miners had achieved a remarkable victory. However, their work did remain dangerous and in the following years some incidents served as a reminder they would earn every penny they had fought so hard to win from Mr Dobbs. In 1887, three men were seriously injured in a fire while a few years later 
another miner was killed in a horrific accident. Explosives in a pit had failed to go off when James Nash approached to see what the issue was. But as he did, the charge exploded, blowing away part of his face and his temple. Incidents like this were sadly part of life in Castlecomer, but the emergence of the trade union movement now held out some hope that things would improve. However, the miners had a long, hard fight ahead of them, as events in wider society changed yet again, impacting life in Castlecomer. While the miners won their great victory in 1881, over the following two decades the Land League, which had been a great support to them, also forced major concessions from the British government who agreed to loan money to tenants to buy their land from the landlords so they would no longer be vulnerable to eviction. This had a huge impact in Castlecomer. In 1894, Sarah Pryor Wandesford, the landlord, died and the lands and mines passed to the 24-year-old Richard Henry Wandesford. A young man, he was willing to adapt to the changing times more than any of his ancestors. He realised that the famine and the landlord had broken the power of landlords like his family and he decided that they needed to rid themselves of their vast 20,000 acres. Under the 1903 Land Act, he decided to sell the estate for £175,000. However, he was not going to leave Castlecomer. Instead, he wanted to take full control over the mining operations in the town and manage them himself. While taking control would take Richard Henry Wandesford 20 years, this move had a profound impact. Once he accomplished it, there was no more mine managers, middlemen or master colliers of any kind between the Wandersford family, the ultimate owners and the miners in the pits. This led to a deepening of class struggle in the town between the emerging union and the Wandersford family. In the next episode, we will see Castlecomer impacted by the War of Independence, the Civil War and indeed the Russian Revolution. It will also see the arrival of the most important individual in the series, the greatest leader Castlecomer miners would ever see, Nicholas Nixie Bourne. Until then, Sloan.